Welcome. I am Dr. David Vasquez Gonzalez. Today's quick pick is titled, Tiers of Intervention for English Learners. Patton's mission. The mission of the Pennsylvania Training and Technical Assistant Network, Patton, is to support the efforts and initiatives of the Bureau of Special Education and to build capacity of local educational agencies to serve students who receive special education services. PDE's commitment to the least restrictive environment. Our goal for each child is to ensure individualized education program, IEP. Teams begin with the general education setting with the use of supplementary aids and services before considering a more restrictive environment. A teacher modifies instruction using an intervention to help struggling children and then checks the child's progress regularly to see if the intervention is working. This approach does not rely on diagnosing the child, but focuses on whether the child has a skill deficit and provides help until the child gets better. RTI is what excellent teachers have always done to help struggling children. The current version of RTI is novel because it mandates good instructional practice. Example, empirically and research-based. An evaluation of academic progress, an example, progress monitoring for all children. As a result, this approach has humanistic appeal. You help all children learn and succeed in the classroom by adjusting instruction to accommodate each child's learning needs. RTI includes three tiers of instruction with more intensive help provided if a child does not respond at each tier. Most of the instruction is provided in the general education. So RTI is more about general education than special education. Tier one consists of general education instruction in the core curriculum and content interventions, including some implemented in differentiated instructional settings, administered class-wide or to struggling students who are identified through universal screening and or benchmark assessments. Instructional strategies at this level are intended to build on student strength and create a foundation for future, further learning and achievement. For English learners, ELLS, Tier 1 includes the English language development instruction provided by the ESL teacher. The call instruction in Tier 1 for ELLS should be delivered in classrooms with teachers who are knowledgeable about the process of acquiring a second language and know how to deliver culturally relevant content, literacy, and language instruction. For ELLS, Tier 1 must be appropriate and enriched in a way that addresses their particular linguistic, social, cultural, and academic needs in a sustained, coordinated, and cohesive way. It is crucial to monitor the adequacy of the entire learning environment created for the students in Tier 1 in an attempt to avoid preventable challenges for all students. Baseline data through universal screening are gathered for our students and achievement is monitored regularly. It is assumed that effective and research-based instruction already occurs in the general education classroom for all students. Tier 1 requires that teachers embrace pedagogy that is rooted in the cultural capital of the students and have its point of departure, the native language and culture. When ELLS enters the school program, the comprehensive benchmark curriculum in which they are instructed, including heritage language development and ESL instruction, become part of Tier 1 instruction. During Tier 1 instruction, if concerns arise about L student progress, the instructional program itself must be examined to determine to the match between the demands of the curriculum and the child's current level of proficiency in the language of instruction. It is important to examine the achievement 
of the student's peers, for example, similar language proficiency, culture, and experiential background to see if they are excelling or not. A typical instructional strategy at Tier 1 is to strengthen literacy readiness, for example, phonics and reading readiness. Once instruction is adjusted to meet each student's individual or personalized needs at Tier 1, progress should be closely monitored and the decisions made as to whether students are meeting predetermined targets or benchmarks. By addressing attention issues at Tier 1, the teacher was working to accommodate normal ranges of ability and experience by facilitating better attending and listening by all students in the general education classroom, as well as addressing specific difficulties with attending and completing tasks by particular students. Modifications in the instructional setting, teaching strategies, and the presentation of specific content are selected to address general issues as well as specific ones, such as presenting lessons in such a way to facilitate better attention to task and core content task completion for all students, including the particular student they are concerned with. Here's an example. First, the teacher identifies the normal expectations for level of attention and task completion and establish criteria for measuring student performance. Then, the teacher selects one of the intervention strategies that will best facilitate students' response while learning content lessons. The targeted intervention strategy is previewed with all the students and the teacher working with the class begins the interventions as part of the daily or weekly instruction practice. At the beginning, the strategy used for intervention is usually con conducted daily. If the intervention selected is effective and students improve their responses by showing measurable increase in attention to task and in task completion, the teacher would then gradually broaden the application to monitoring specific students of concern. If the intention was not a success, then the teacher might need to consider more drastic measures. This would include intensifying the intervention by moving the student into a tier two small group or an individual work setting. Now tier two. Tier two interventions involve more intensive small group interventions with frequent progress monitoring. A major difference at tier two is the way interventions are developed. Differentiated instruction enhances learning for our students by engaging them in activities that better respond to their particular learning needs, strengths, and preferences. Tier 2 consists of a small group of students who do not respond sufficiently to most effective Tier 1 instruction and curriculum. Tier 2 supports is viewed as supplementary support because it is delivered within the classroom setting in addition to the core content instruction. In Tier 2, students receive targeted intentions, interventions only in specific areas such as academic, behavior, or both in which their needs are not being met. By gathering of authentic assessments, data from classroom observations, review of student work samples, performance on common assessments, student-teacher conference field notes, as well as standardized measures that are used in schools. Team can target and support students in those particular areas. When receiving targeted intervention, students' progress continues to be assessed through ongoing data collection, which can be both qualitative and quantitative, to determine the length of time they would benefit from receiving Tier 2 assistance. Students move in and out of tiers of intervention based on individual needs and performance. Four key features of Tier 2. These are, number one, supplementary resources to implement high quality instructional strategies. Number two, targeted interventions at high levels of intensity. Number three, ongoing formative classroom assessment to monitor students' responses to interventions. And number four, 
team decision making and collaboration. Tier three, tier three strategic or intensive interventions involves highly intensive, specifically targeted individual instruction with even more frequent progress monitoring. The dual process of tier three problem solving are to resolve learning and behavioral problems, thus preventing the need for special education. This is the most intensive level of support within the general education setting. Tier three represents strategic or intensive individualized support designed to meet the specific needs of the student. Support at this level is provided by a highly qualified teacher. Generally, outside of the classroom setting, it may be of longer duration. The strategies can be the same as tier two, but they are more intensive and individualized. Culturally responsive uh, RTI model. To be culturally responsive is to value, consider, and integrate individuals' culture, language, and heritage, and experiences to lead and support their learning and development. NCRESH 2008. Now, how can we create a culturally and linguistically responsive model? According to NCRESH, culturally responsive RTI models should reflect the following features. Number one, culture and equity foundation. Number two, culture mediation of learning processes. Number three, all students are provided with culturally responsive curriculum and interventions. Culturally responsive RTIs, first tier, the universal intervention tier, includes culturally responsive curriculum and instruction for all students. It facilitates the provision of high quality learning opportunities for all students. One way to make a school's existing multi-tier system of support more culturally and linguistically responsive is to consider the social cultural context for learning. The following are seven factors that consider the social cultural context for learning. Number one, learning environmental factors. Opportunity to learn refers to equitable conditions or circumstances within the school or classroom that promote learning for all students. There are three considerations that help create this learning environment. Number one, it includes careful consideration of what curricula are chosen that make their learning materials culturally responsive. Two, the physical learning facilities are equitable. And three, that teachers who work with diverse learners are appropriately certified and have ongoing opportunities to learn about their students' unique educational needs. Two, academic achievement and instructional factors. When developing instructional units of study, teachers and other personnel can collaboratively plan how they will systematically integrate academic, language, and literacy instruction into each of their content lessons through clearly stated language and content objectives. Three, oral language and literacy factors. These are the most complex for all students but it pays an especially important role in L's academic performance. Oral language and literacy development are closely connected. For language development, schools that already emphasize oral language development for their K-12 students have established an excellent foundation for supporting L's. For literacy factor, it is essential that L's literacy instruction in English begin always with a meaningful context connected to the curricular themes and big ideas. Then teachers can help students connect their experiences to the topic of the reading and build the necessary schema through visuals, experiences, previewing, and discussion. Next, teacher must work on the oral language students need in order to recognize and comprehend what they are reading. This skill work can be embedded into this meaningful context rather than taught in isolation. The more connected all the elements of literacy are to the main theme, the more cohesive and meaningful literacy instruction will be for else. Four, 
personal and family factors. Getting to know more about the students' families, communities, and home life can help schools build instruction on L's fun of knowledge, experiences, and skills in, to instruction, intervention, and assessment. Five, physical and psychological factors. Students' physical and psychological well-being is foundation and connected to their learning and how they feel at school. Due to this reality, schools may develop a protocol for addressing issues within this factor in a systematic way with all students. Some factors to consider are disease or medical condition, dental, vision, hearing, nutrition, and access to food, ability to access treatment for health conditions, mental health, including anxiety, depression, social and emotional development, and feelings of belonging to school and the wider community. Six, previous schooling factors. Gathering information about this factor is an important when a student is moving from a, one school to another within the same district as it is when he or she is coming from another country. The lack of cohesive instructional program can result in a form of interrupted schooling, even when students' entire experience has been within one school system. It is important to look deeper into students' previous schooling experiences. Number seven, cross-cultural factors. Els are going through a process of acculturation as they move daily between their home culture and school culture. Schools and districts must work diligently to reduce and eliminate cultural and linguistic biases, prejudices, stereotypes, and other discriminatory elements in the school environment. Asking team members, teachers, administrators, and all school personnel who work with health to examine their own cultural identities along a variety of cultural variables can be an excellent way of beginning the conversation on how to develop cultural reciprocity as practitioners and consequently how to deliver culturally responsive instruction, intervention, and assessment. For more information, please email me or Ms. Alecandri at our Harrisburg office or Ms. Bramer at our Pittsburgh office or Ms. Dudek at our East office. Thank you for watching.